Hi, everyone. Nice to uh, see everyone on the screen, the extent that I can see everyone. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to help welcome Claire Boulanger to Madison. Uh, she is one of our newest members of our Southeast Asia uh, community. Uh, so uh, just to give you a sense of her background, she did her undergraduate at State University of New York at Plattsburgh, uh, majored in anthropology and studio arts and graduated summa cum laude, and then went on to do um, MA and PhD at the University of Minnesota. Uh, she had, uh, for her MA, she concentrated in American studies and her PhD uh, then was uh, on Southeast Asia, workers are one race, constructive relations in the West Malaysian workforce. And uh, she taught uh, initially uh, back in uh, here in the neighborhood at Beloit and then became a professor of anthropology and the dog has just arrived. Go away, Lola. Um, uh, spent most of her career as a professor of anthropology uh, in the Department of Social and Behavioral so Sciences at Colorado Mesa University. Uh, so she's Professor Emeritus at, uh, from there. And then uh, continued, has continued to remain active, including serving as an EL, ESL instructor for the Peace Corps in China uh, and uh, anthropology instructor at the University of Memphis. And right now she's also doing work at the University of Wisconsin Survey Center. Uh, also in her background that I thought would be interesting for people to know is that she was a Fulbright uh, at Da Nang, Vietnam, where she was drawing on her uh, MA in American Studies. She taught American Studies there. And her uh, publications include, uh, most recently, uh, she edited the second edition of a volume called Reflecting on America, Anthropological Views of U.S. Culture, uh, published by Rutledge. And uh, another book on biocultural evolution. And another one, A Sleeping Tiger, Ethnicity Class, and New Dayak Dreams in Urban Sarawak. Uh, there are others, but those are the ones that I'll highlight. And she's been very active uh, in the American Anthropological Association, uh, working particularly with the Federation of Small Anthropology Programs, uh, part of the uh, American Anthropological General Anthropology Division, Borneo Research Council, and the High Plains Society for Applied Anthropology. So with that, by way of introduction, let us welcome Claire to our Madison community, uh, where she will be talking to us about Malaysian politics, the state of play. So welcome, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I apologize. I hope everyone can hear me. And if you can't hear me, signal and we'll do what we can do. But you know technology nowadays. Uh, and mine itself is not particularly reliable. Uh, I'm also going to try to get through uh, this talk with a somewhat bruised throat, but I have my glass of ice bomb here. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will uh, take us through. It does seem strange to be talking about Malaysian politics in a week when politics blew up in Myanmar, but uh, it sounds like you'll be handling that fairly quickly. Uh, Malaysian politics currently are on COVID hiatus, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but what I want to do, as is pretty typical of anyone who gives this sort of talk, is to share a slideshow with you. Uh, and I'm hoping to have lots of time for Q&A, not only because of my voice, but because I think uh, everyone on this um, thread is probably very well versed in politics of somewhere. Uh, and I think the comparison uh, will be fascinating. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, is that visible to everyone? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, as you see the same backdrop photo uh, without me in it, which is just as well. Uh, and that is downtown KL. Now uh, I've entitled my talk Malaysian politics state of play because there is 
everything about that title that is a pun. And that in itself is probably going to indicate to you that I'm not going to be particularly serious about this top and talk uh, because there's just so much uh, to, to talk about that doesn't sound particularly serious. Uh, and so I hope I'm not being frivolous. I will say that when it comes to Malaysian politics, the word I often use to describe uh, it is rollicking. Uh, so state of play, as I say, all puns intended. Uh, we are talking about a state as in a modern nation state. We are also talking about a way or condition of being state of play. Of course, we're visiting Malaysian politics uh, in terms of what's happening now. Uh, we are perhaps most importantly talking about a play as in a Sandiwara uh, in Malay. Uh, and for a long time, Malaysians have seen their politics as a kind of play acting. Uh, and uh, like a play, perhaps not to be taken seriously. Uh, in all instances, like a play having a cast of characters, a plot, uh, a counterplot, uh, et cetera. And like a play, you can't really trust what people are saying. There's a script and there are scripts involved. Uh, and so for instance, there are scripts involved in uh, being part of the Malaysian uh, mainstream versus the opposition. And all of those scripts got uh, reversed or tangled when the opposition became the mainstream, and I'll get back to that. But in any event, um, because on the lips of many Malaysians is the word Sandiwara when they talk about politics, uh, they themselves are saying, well, what are we going to see today? What What is the media show? Oh, and by the way, uh, Malaysia, no stranger to fake news. Uh, and we'll probably get back to that too. Uh, of course, we have here up in, in this corner, the kite, uh, the Malay kite, uh, which is um, uh, in, you know, symbolic of this whole business of, do we take this seriously or not, uh, playing around. Uh, and then of course, there's the gamesmanship uh, involved in Malaysian politics, constant. Um, playing uh, with this or that ploy, uh, et cetera. So uh, moving on uh, from that slide, I do want to mention, again, something you might be familiar with. Uh, in 2018, there was an astonishing election in Malaysia. Uh, unbelievably exciting. Uh, and of course, as I stop and think of it, I did not take down the number of years, um, trying to think, uh, in any event, uh, from the time of uh, Malaysian independence, Malayan independence, the mainland portion, in 1957, there was one coalition of ruling parties, uh, you know, and there were people jumping in of that and, and jumping into that and being expelled from that, et cetera. But uh, essentially the ruling parties were UMNO, the Malay party, uh, MCA, the Chinese party, uh, and um, MIC, uh, the Indian party. And of course, Malay, Chinese, Indian are the way we refer to the main ethnic groups of mainland uh, Malaysia. Uh, and uh, the, um, you know, they were all in coalition. Originally that coalition was the Alliance. And then after the riots of 1969, the Alliance was reconstituted as the Barisan. And so the Barisan had been in power all of this time, the Barisan, the National Front. Uh, and in 2018, the Barisan was evicted from power, which was astonishing. It was like people were saying, gee, didn't even think that could happen. But the electorate was fired up. And the electorate was fired up mainly because of this huge scandal uh, called the 1MDB scandal uh, after the investment fund uh, it was named after. We'll get back to that. Uh, and of course, Malaysian government never a stranger to scandal, but this one was big. Uh, and um, 
so people were fired up. Uh, the electorate was fired up. People started to kind of lose some of their cynicism about politics, thinking in terms of what's possible. Other voters were kind of like, well, we're desperate. We'll do this thing we've never done before. Uh, and uh, it really was amazing. And to illustrate that, I've got a little clip. I'm not going to show you the whole video, but I have a little clip of a video that was made. Uh, and I got the link to this video from my ex-husband, who may or may not be have dropped in here and shout out to him if, if he was. Uh, but uh, the um, video is about overseas postal voters uh, who had not gotten their ballots on time and were rushing to get in their ballots for GE14, that is the 2018 election. They had uh, rightful suspicions that they were being frozen out of the electoral process because they were pretty reliably not a Barisan vote. Uh, so I'll just show you a little bit of that video because I do think uh, the mood is infectious. There you How's go. that? In GE14, Overseas postal voters faced an impossible challenge. I knew that I might not get my postal vote because of the really short campaign period. I've been waiting anxiously for my ballot paper. By Friday, it was still in Malaysia. Actually, me and my wife almost gave up. They arrived on Tuesday morning. So I thought, how are we going to get it back to Malaysia on time? Me and my wife were just in a panic mode. So I was like, I, was, I, I felt hopeless already. If you're in Hong Kong and you get your postal vote on a Wednesday, the day of election, <laughs> you will be very, very pissed off. Can I say pissed off? And that's when a global movement began. AKA... The giant global Gotong Royale. <laughs> Malaysians all around the world got organized. The first step was about getting all the votes from around New Zealand, from around the country, it was in time. So subsequently, I started a Facebook post to suggest to collect money to someone who would actually hand carry the postal ballots back home. I texted Chu Yi Lim and asked her, are you willing to go back to Malaysia to do this for all of us? And the response was instantaneous. When I knew that my postal vote had arrived in Dubai, that was the same time I decided that I would fly back. If there were any votes that needed to be delivered, I would gladly take them with me. I also share a Facebook post so that if there's any overseas voter who want to bring back their vote, I will be able to help. And um, I say I'm, I can help, you know, ferry some votes back, thinking that it's going to be like only one or two. Once careers volunteered, voters rushed to meet them. Okay, come. I'll come over to your place uh, first thing in the morning and go find this person. And then I tell everyone else, come, come now, come as soon as possible to Heathrow. I took the ballots and I drove straight away to the airport and then just passed the ballot. It was like requests from Facebook, from Twitter, from WhatsApp. There were 7,979 Malaysians abroad who were eligible for postal voting and volunteers flew home more than anyone could imagine. In total, there are about 110 votes. So I started off having five Subang votes and then it grew overnight to 20, 40, 60, 100. And then when I woke up, it was 150 and then when we gathered, it was 200. We had a total of about 300 votes that, we, that our team ran out. I, I really admire the people overseas who really went across hell, high water and everything to just get their votes back. Okay. I can. Uh, right. And, but I think that video does convey the excitement uh, that people were feeling about the election. And the amazing thing is that uh, the election actually did, as they say, uh, oust the Barisan from power and put into power a, a formerly opposition coalition. Uh, you get confused as to who gets called opposition nowadays, but the formerly opposition coalition called Pakatan Harapan, uh, which is the hope, hopeful pact, the pact of hope. Uh, and um, the candidate for prime minister within the Pakatan Harapan uh, was Tun Dr. Mahathir bin Muhammad, uh, and those of you who have followed Malaysian politics, uh, but perhaps have not stepped, checked in lately, are saying, what? <laughs> because yes, this was the man who was prime minister from 1981 to 2003, 
Uh, and yes, he served again from 2018 to 2020. And yes, there are rumors that he would like to get back in, although he's recently denied this, but who knew he would come back in 2018? The thing is, uh, he did serve, he was at that time, the longest serving prime minister in the world. He did step back in 2003. No one ever expected him to step back, uh, he did. Uh, he uh, never um, stopped being involved in politics though. Uh, he kind of single-handedly took down his successor, uh, Abdullah Badawi, uh, and then put in the man who was his favorite at the time, which it was Najib Tun Razak, but later turned against Tun Razak, uh, Najib uh, for uh, some pretty serious reasons. Uh, became the head of a Malay party called Bersatu. Uh, and by the way, Malay has the, the Malay language has a tremendous number of words for unity. And I think they're running out of them with all of these new parties. But anyway, Bersatu. Uh, and Bersatu joined Pakatan Harapan. Uh, and uh, when it joined uh, and decided to support Pakatan's bid for power, it said, but our guy has to be the PM candidate, which was uh, Dr. Mahathir or Dr. M. Uh, and yes, by the way, he is also currently 95 years old. Uh, so he was in power, he's not any longer, still agitating, we'll get back to that. The idea behind uh, the original uh, electoral lineup is that perhaps uh, at some point, uh, Anwar Ibrahim, uh, who has been in the running for PM for a long time, the head of the PKR party, the People's Justice Party, uh, and uh, the subject of uh, rather incredible uh, persecutions, uh, he was, um, he was a young firebrand. He was the head of the uh, Muslim youth organization. He agitated for the rights of the poor, peasant rights, very much the social activist. Uh, and because he was a little dangerous in that position, the government eventually sucked him into the mainstream. He actually served as Mahathir's deputy prime minister for years went against uh, Mahathir uh, in um, the late 1990s when there was a financial crisis. Uh, Mahathir slapped him back uh, and seriously slapped him because there were incredible things like the first sodomy trial uh, against Anwar. I'm not gonna go into that unless somebody wants to in the Q&A, but let me just repeat, sodomy trial, sodomy won, uh, and uh, so he was, and he was also convicted on corruption. He was jailed, he was beaten in prison. He uh, got out, gets involved in politics again, um, goes up against the, goes up against Najib, uh, the subsequent prime minister who slaps him with a second sodomy charge, not directly. Uh, sodomy two goes on, Anwar's jailed again, uh, comes back roaring on the political scene. And here was his moment, GE14, possibly being the successor to Mahathir because how long was Mahathir gonna stay on the scene? He's 95. Uh, and so uh, the idea was uh, perhaps uh, Anwar would get his just due eventually, and uh, it has not happened yet, and it doesn't look like it's ever going to happen. But let's cast our mind back to what was happening in the wake of uh, GE14. Malaysian electorate astonished at itself, astonished at its power. I prepared a paper for the American Anthropological Association meetings in Vancouver in 2019, and I did a survey monkey um, uh, survey uh, in that previous summer to kind of poll Malaysians uh, on what they thought about the election. And mostly I was looking for what language they were using about the election. Uh, and that is by way of saying, um, you know, my purposes uh, behind doing the survey were very limited. 
uh, and my uh, survey sample is actually really quite bad in Malaysian terms because it's dominated by Malaysian Indians because again, my ex-husband was involved and he was the whip as in majority whip. He was like whipping the people he knew back in Malaysia to answer the survey. So I got 54 respondents, but the um, problem was they were mostly uh, Malaysian ethnic Indians, uh, very much a minority in the country. But again, I wanted to see the language that people were using to describe what had happened in the election. So for those limited purposes, I think the sample is fine. Uh, and so I'll show you some of the results. This is after the election and the bloom has started to fall off the rose. There is a lot of internal fighting, quarreling, uh, backstabbing in Pakistan. People are wondering if Pakistan is going to be able to live up to its promises, etc. So this was question one. You can see that people are still happy and excited about Pakistan winning. Uh, and they were allowed to check more than one answer here, but happy and excited were uh, obviously the predominant answers. I also, because I'm an anthropologist, selected, solicited qualitative comments on these results. Uh, so some of the selected comments, we managed to overthrow a very corrupt and inept government. And uh, I am especially happy with that first comment uh, because it's really the only one, if, if I'm remembering correctly, of all the comments that I, I had on all the questions, where people were actually saying something in, a, in an active voice. We managed to do something. On all the other comments, people were essentially saying, well, that happened, or uh, phrasing it in the passive voice, not inserting themselves as active agents in the comments at all, which I found fascinating. Uh, the hope that Pakistan is a fairer government to all races. And this goes to show you that my, um, my sample was in fact a biased sample uh, because it will only be the non-Malays pretty much who will use words like fairer government. Uh, they may add to all races. But that of course is a red flag to Malay politicians who whip up resent resentment on the part of Malays saying, look, these foreigners, these Bandatang, these people, the Chinese and Indians who've been living here for centuries, but uh, nonetheless, you know, they're trying to steal your rights as a sovereign people. So those are buzzwords in Malaysian politics. I'm not going to go through every comment. Um, survey results question two, you will see here that people very early on had uh, some serious misgivings about Mahathir. They liked the idea of the opposition being in power. They couldn't figure out, like nobody could figure out, um, you know, why it had to be Mahathir, why it had to be returning to someone who was really the symbol of the Barasan for years and years and years and ruled through the Barasan. Uh, the idea was he'd undergone a sea change. He had adopted the script of the opposition, the multiracial script of the opposition and so on. So people were willing to give him a shot. But you'll notice here from the survey results, we have almost an equal number of people saying, by the way, they couldn't have more than one response here. Uh, you have uh, people saying he's changed, but for the better. But then those people are outnumbered by the people who say he hasn't changed. And the people are really not sure what's going on. So some comments associated with this. He's the same man with the same mindset. He's wearing his dirty shoes now. Here's a, a positive comment about Mahathir. He cared for the country and that's why he's returned to set it up for the benefit of the people, you and me. Uh, but then there are the distrustful comments once again. Uh, and then there's the comment, there was no reliable person to count on. We didn't have anyone else. We just kind of went with Mahathir as um, really the only choice here. So you see, and the summer of 2019, people are like, yeah, I'm not sure we should have done that, but what kind of choice did we have? Survey results question three, what sentence best expresses why you think the election turned out the way it did? 
I expected a lot more respondents to say they were angry. They were angry at the previous uh, government. They were angry at the scandal. Uh, but, and, and I, I put that choice there as a way of seeing, was this an emotional choice? Was this, was this a choice powered by emotion? I was angry, so I voted the way I did. But the vast majority of my respondents, even the ones who were angry, uh, did uh, vote for or, or did select Malaysians just needed a change. And that to me, I was trying to suggest, was there an emotional component? Was there not emotional component? This you know, was not an emotional component. They just needed a change. And so that was what attracted the majority of attention in that particular question. Here's some comments. Excuse me. We just needed to see what other type of leaders could change the problems of Malaysia. So we're just gonna swap one horse for another uh, and we'll see if that works. Uh, and this idea that uh, Malaysia, you know, the scandal had brought Malaysia to international attention and not in a good way. Uh, so we have to do something to repair our reputation. Question four was just a matter of soliciting more uh, qualitative comments. And you can see here that people are frightened uh, a little bit, concerned about uh, the future. You do see the comment, never thought Pakatan would win. Uh, and so people voted as a kind of, well, we're pro protesting, but it's not going to do any good. Uh, and we have a positive comment underneath that. And by the way, if people are adding to chat, I don't have the chat up, so uh, you may want to break in and say something if you need to, because uh, I'll bring the chat up at, when I, we do the Q&A. Uh, so uh, you see in 2019, and things have definitely started to go wrong in Pakistan at this point, that people are thinking, well, I think we did a good thing, but it hasn't turned out well. And why it didn't turn out well is that uh, the politicking within Pakistan eventually uh, resulted in Mahathir resigning as PM, and uh, as um, and what we had um, was um, this incredible um, fight for power. Um, Azmin Ali, long a thorn in the side of Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, both in PKR, at least at the time, the uh, People's Justice Party, uh, but Azmin had long ago gone against Anwar, had been vying with him uh, for uh, a power. Uh, Azmin seized his chance. Many people think he was put up to it by Mahathir because there is now all this sense that Mahathir never really wanted Anwar to succeed him. Uh, and Azmin carried out what was called, and it was really quite a, a lame coup, uh, but uh, the Sheridan coup, and that's named after the hotel chain, Sheridan, uh, because that's where the meeting uh, was held. In any event, uh, Azmin and his people threw Malaysia into such political turmoil that the king uh, was called upon to repair the situation. And the king did something that I'm not sure anyone expected. You know, he had people petitioning him like Anwar, et cetera. And the king actually threw the prime ministership to another politician in Bersatu, which is uh, Mahathir's party. Uh, and that was Muhyiddin Yassin, who is currently uh, the prime minister. And perhaps the idea would have been that Yassin would settle things down because colorless is, maybe that's cruel, but um, let's put it this way, steadfast, steady. Uh, this is not a man who um, has a great deal of charisma, has a great deal of, of power. The idea was that he'd be kind of a caretaker until something else could happen. Something else the king did, which was interesting and very frustrating to my non-Malay friends, was that he essentially threw power back to the Malays uh, Pakistan is supposed to be, I mean, it's Malay dominated, but it's supposed to be a multiracial um, coalition. But essentially, Bersatu, which pulled out of Pakistan, uh, began to unite with other Malay parties 
uh, notably the Islamic party, and also with um, the uh, party that had been the backbone of the Barisan, that is Amno. Now the head of Amno uh, at one time and still a power within it is this fellow, uh, Najib Dunoraza, uh, PM from, Prime Minister from 2009 to 2018 and at the center of the one MDB scandal. Uh, here, uh, you'll notice he's wearing a t-shirt. He was tried, he was convicted for corruption. Conviction is currently on appeal. Uh, and uh, Najib is still a force in Malaysian politics. He would love for UMNO to be back at the helm of everything because of course, if UMNO were at the helm, he would be able to get you know that appeal one tossed aside. You know, he could influence the judiciary. So he's angling really hard to get back and to get people to ignore uh, the 1MDB scandal. Uh, you'll notice on the t-shirt it says Mal Maluapa, which means what do I have to be ashamed of, uh, which is how he responded uh, to people who questioned his role in 1MDB. Now, you know, he's either guilty of uh, absconding with funds, in which case he should be convicted, or he's too stupid to know that that's what he was doing, in which case he should not be PM. But, you know, this is, this is what happens. Uh, you'll also notice on the t-shirt, Bosku, uh, which means my boss, uh, which became something uh, that my, Najib became known for. I still have people behind me. They think I am their boss. So, all right. Uh, behind Najib, just briefly, I'll show you um, Lo Take Jo, uh, uh, or otherwise known as Jo Lo, uh, who was uh, really the mastermind of the one MDB scheme. He is uh, a Malaysian fellow, just shy of his 40th birthday right now. Uh, he uh, was the primary, he was the one who was um, beefing up the funds in the, uh, in, in one MDB. Uh, through attracting investors. And he was uh, attracting a lot of Middle Eastern investment, um, uh, uh, Emirates, Emirati uh, investment, et cetera, that particular area of the Middle East, uh, people were bankrolling him. And what Jolo was doing was uh, kicking back enough to his investors so that they thought, well, in the future, this is really gonna pay off. He was kicking enough forward to Najib so that Najib had enough money to do whatever he wanted on the Malaysian scene, which was mainly a matter of financing by-elections, buying votes, maybe not outright, but at least indirectly, making sure development projects were funded so that people would see the Barisan was on their side, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, you have, um, you know, uh, and, and if in fact Najib's wife, um, got a uh, you know new handbag or a new diamond you know so what perks of leadership uh, and his um his wife's son uh so what he gets enough money to bankroll the making of the movie the wolf of wall street still perks of leadership uh also uh jola was uh skimming off a great deal for himself uh financing lavish, crazy parties. That is, of course, Paris Hilton in the photo. Uh, but he had many, many uh, friends in high places, many, many media friends, Alicia Keys, uh, the people involved in the Wolf of, of Wall Street. Um, Miranda Kerr was his girlfriend for a while. She used to be married to um, Orlando Bloom, I think. Anyway, uh, Hollywood gossip. But um, so we have, have Jolo living high, but you could argue this is what biologists would call a costly signal because he would be so out there in terms of the money he spent and the parties he would finance is that people would say, wow, he's a really successful investor. I want to throw money his way. So uh, he's on the run. He's in hiding, well, 
kind of openly secret that he's in China. He's done a few reports with Al Jazeera lately, and it's interesting because he seems to think that if he just gives back enough money, there's no crime committed here. There's, you know, he doesn't expect a criminal uh, prosecution, which <laughs> he may be right. So that's an ongoing situation. And before we leave the cast of characters, I just wanted to mention two longtime opposition politicians. Uh, and when I say opposition, I'm talking about in the pre-GE 14 days, the um, elect in pre-election days, these were uh, politicians, father and son, uh, long standing in opposition, part of an opposition party called the DAP, the Democratic Action Party. Uh, and uh, again, amazing to see them when they were actually part of the power structure, uh, which they are no longer uh, in, well, they still have power, but in the opposition. Uh, amazing to see them uh, take uh, the helm of politics in Malaysia, even for such a brief time. Lim Guan Ang uh, was, um, has been, and you know, it's hard to say um, how, accurate, you know, whether these things are true or not, but he's been set up on graft and corruption charges and being tried. And it's almost as though uh, the new ru ruling coalition, this coalition of Malay parties, uh, wants to see the opposition have their own Najib, even though what um, Lim Guaneng has been accused of is, doesn't rise to the level of one MDB, but nonetheless. The idea is to build distrust, you know, nobody's honest, nobody's out for, for you, you might as well stick with us. So that's ongoing. Um, I will say what's not ongoing right now uh, is active or overt politicking because I, Muhyiddin has declared a state of emergency in Malaysia about the COVID crisis. And there's no question the COVID numbers are high and it, they've had something of a surge, uh, but it's also a very convenient way uh, for Muhyiddin, uh, of course, to get the heat off his, his back. Uh, to, um, it, Parliament has been suspended. Uh, his um, enemies are kind of in a state of restlessness and helplessness. Uh, and I don't doubt he's trying to consolidate uh, his position. Uh, right now, people, a vote for him or support him as a matter of um, pretty much, again, the only game in town. And I'm sure that Muhyiddin would like to be seen as more uh, than that. So uh, we'll see what happens uh, after the state of emergency, if somehow Muhyiddin is able to prolong it, to consolidate power, to look like a viable and long-term leader. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the soap opera is in hiatus right now as soap operas tend to get uh, under pandemic conditions. Uh, I'm trying to think if I have another slide, I guess they'll find out. Ah, and I'll just conclude my slideshow with uh, a couple comments uh, from the um, surveys, uh, very cynical comments and cynicism is a word that I've associated with uh, Malaysian politics for a long time, or at least on the part of the electorate. Uh, the idea is it doesn't make any difference what we do. It's not going to make a difference. That's why the election was so extraordinary. And that's why the collapse of the Pakistan government has been so disheartening. Uh, but people, you, you saw from the slides that said Mahathir, you know, was not to be trusted, etc. It was almost as though having Mahathir uh, as PM again gave the electorate and out, you know, they said, well, we tried to, to support this change, but it didn't work. And of course it wasn't gonna work because Mahathir was at the top. So, um, you know, we were really right all along. So returning to the cynical position, you know, it wasn't too damaging to them. It wasn't a, a sense of, oh, you know, our, all our hopes are dashed. Uh, wise people kept in reserve a little something that said, yeah, but this is probably not gonna work. We'd better uh, uh, steal ourselves and we'd better prepare ourselves. And so um, we have uh, people uh, in my surveys commenting that, yeah, you know, this was gonna happen. Uh, so not surprised at all.
And this is even before Pakistan actually officially collapsed. Uh, so um, I think that actually concludes my show and I'll stop sharing, uh, but I will allow all of you to um, jump in and either contribute your, um, uh, contribute your ideas about um, uh, your own political situations, the ones that you're, um, uh, so um, free for all right now. Uh, any questions or comments or um, comparative material? I have a question. Yes. Um, I guess it's my uh, I Thai as well as like Southeast Asian, like mainland Southeast Asian understanding, but uh, what is the role of like the military in terms of all these politicking? Like, is this cynicism affect um, enough outlook of people in terms of democracy that might um, create a situation where the military could intervene in the future? Uh, the military does not have the power in Malaysia that it has in other Southeast Asian countries and it hasn't had that power. So I don't think the military um, has that power now, uh, nor will it intervene. Uh, but, um, you know, as, as far as I know, uh, they are not waving in the in the wings. Um, so, yes, um, I think essentially the king will continue to intervene if he sees that there uh, is is another blow up in government. But otherwise, the idea is, you know, we tamp things down with the COVID uh, lockdown, and then when things emerge again, um, we make sure that things are as steady as possible. But that's a good question. It's interesting because that is a contrast, I think, we, between Malaysia and other Southeast Asian nations. And those of you who are not only Thai people, but also Indonesian people uh, and Myanmar people can, can comment on that. Any other questions or comments? And I'd be happy to elaborate on some of the things I glossed over. I, I have two questions. I, I think I'll save my second one for later. But um, my first question, I was just wondering if you could comment on Anwar Ibrahim's strange path in politics. Uh, in 99, I remember, oh, Catherine's asking exactly the same question. Uh, well, mostly. The, it was so, such a huge international um, story and so troubling when he was in prison for sodomy, quote unquote. Um, and the, my impression at the time was that that was a setup and, and there was, you know, it was scandalous that they would even try to frame him and put him in jail just to quiet the opposition or remove it. Uh, but then later he received a pardon from the Sultan. And I'm just, I was just wondering what your sense is of how these questions um, are playing out in Malaysia, you know, the backlash against liberalism and tolerance that we've seen elsewhere in Indonesia, for example, and how that fits in with the politics of these sodomy charges and the long imprisonment that he faced. Um, and yet when he had a comeback, he seemed to be an ally of Mahathir. So any comments well, on that? Well, right. And, and you know, strange bedfellows is a pretty good way of yeah. describing Malaysian politics as well. Uh, because you would not have thought that uh, Anwar would ever forgive Mahathir uh, for what happened. I don't want to say too much about the sodomy trials because, trials because I can say a lot, uh, so stop me. Uh, but um, there's no question that there were certainly people in Malaysia who thought that the sodomy trials, trials were already giving a, a, you know, a black mark against Malaysia's reputation in the world. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's difficult to say to the extent that anyone in Malaysia ever believed the sodomy charges, uh, or, but they were very convenient political levers uh, for everyone involved. You know, Mahathir could justify getting rid of his deputy prime minister because, oh my God, morality. And I, I should say, there's a difference, of course, between sodomy and rape. Uh, for a, because sodomy itself is a crime in Malaysian law uh, that, you know, for a long time, they just coasted on that. And eventually, I think re, uh, responding to some of world opinion, they started to indicate that this was forced sodomy. That is that 
uh, Anwar has, was forcing himself on young men. Um, sodomy won, uh, you know, going after him for sodomy was the best thing they could do to try to separate him from his Muslim base. Uh, because, you know, this is so un-Islamic. Un there were plenty of reasons uh, that people were putting forth that Anwar should not be PM. In fact, somebody came out with a pamphlet called 50 Reasons Why Anwar Should Not Be PM. And they include every manner of sexual uh, activity, crime, peccadillo, you can imagine, including with women, with men. During the first sodomy trial, doesn't make much sense, but they actually brought in a mattress that was allegedly soaked with the semen of Anwar and the vaginal fluids of his female lover. Uh, you know, so these trials were incredibly absurd. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, there was a man who insisted he was sodomized uh, by Anwar. He had to change the date as to when it happened because the building he claimed it happened in didn't actually exist at the time. Uh, and, you know, so this, it was slipshod, but Sandiwara, big production. Uh, and so, and he was also convicted on corruption. So he was jailed at that time. Uh, he was um, beaten. Second sodomy trial came under Najib. Najib was feeling as though Anwar, now released from prison, gaining too much power, sodomy child. And this one had more the sense of rape, you know, uh, forced sodomy. That particular victim of the sodomy uh, uh, claimed that he had, uh, and I apologize for these details, but um, this is what Malaysians said too. My little kid knows what sodomy is now, uh, you know, because it was all over the news. But um, the victim in the second instance said that he had actually not had a bowel movement for three days so he could preserve the evidence. Uh, and so, you know, again, ridiculous. Uh, and uh, so to what extent, you know, people saw the pageantry and were perhaps overwhelmed by the pageantry, but I don't know that people necessarily thought Anwar was gu guilty of sodomy. I think what they thought was so many forces arrayed against him, he's never going to succeed. It, it's, you know, this is never going to be his day, his moment. By the way, Azmin, a video, and by the way, a lot of these sodomy accusations have involved videos that allegedly show people, you know, men having sex, one of them being uh, Anwar. There's actually been a video that surfaced showing Azmin allegedly having sex with a man, so, you know, anyone can play this game. And again, it's more a signal of, we really want these people to be out of the picture, not so much a signal of uh, anti-homosexuality or anti, um, you know, uh, difficulties with, with um, um, understanding why that sort of thing might happen. Um, I'm sorry, it, I probably have gone past your question. Yo, uh, and, and Catherine asked it. Um, well, yeah, Catherine was asking more broadly, how do Malaysians think the world sees them? Right, and more, whether... more concerns certainly uh, with respect to this last election uh, with the corruption. Uh, then the sodomy, which again could, you know, easily be seen as a kind of joke, uh, given some of the evidence presented as tri at trial and, you know, um, it, it, it was a massive play, uh, Sandiwara, uh, in that sense. So, um, but, you know, the concern for corruption and they felt they got Najib out, but here's Najib angling to get back in. So who knows what the future will bring. Other questions? Or comments? I, I could say too about um, sodomy and, and just in general, um, when the Badr-San was in power, they controlled the press. Uh, and um, so people didn't have any reliable news sources. So they essentially ran their politics. Uh, okay, we have a hand raised uh, through rumor, 
uh, an innuendo, uh, which Malaysians love to trade in uh, with respect to their politics because they didn't have anything to, you know, else to go on. So, and that's still happening, even though the press is uh, a freer than it used to be. Um, uh, Saidat, uh, is that your name? Yeah, Sajira. Sajira. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't miss the J. Okay. Um, uh, if somebody else has any more questions, you can uh, ask. I'm talking too much already. No, it seems I, as though I've, I've silenced everyone. <laughs> I have uh, two, I guess, kind of related questions. So first one is that it seems that this kind of like, and pardon, the, pardon my French, um, uh, it's a term of political rat fucking, uh, seems to be extremely effective in terms of Malaysian, uh, I guess, popular opinion, public opinion in terms of in terms of how it affect uh, parliamentary coalition building, as well as how it how people came into power. And so I was wondering what kind of like uh, receptivity among the people in terms of these, I guess, fake news or these false information and allegation. Like, do they see these basically as kind of like tabloid, like how uh, like you know um, celebrity do stuff like that, but in a more like elevated sense. And another thing I want to ask is about judicial independence. Like, is that a kind of like something moving forward that need to be addressed in order to create like a more, I guess, um, this kind of like liberal ideas of multi-party politics in Malaysia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, in terms of the first one, uh, yes, you know, people go after each other viciously. And again, the extent to which uh, it's believed uh, by people, at least the specific allegations or accusations. And of course, the sodomy trials resulted in conviction for Anwar both times. So that looks like there's the air of legitimacy. Uh, but I really think that Malaysians in general, and I am generalizing flagrantly, are cynical enough about politics to interpret these things more as a signal of who's in and who's out. And if we wanna be a winner, we wanna back the winning horse. So, you know, they'll pay lip service to, oh yes, he's a bloody sodomite, but mostly it's a matter of, you know, maybe he's not our man. Uh, he's, been, he's been fingered, that's perhaps not a good word to use, um, you know, and, and uh, indicted and uh, found wanting. And so maybe we just want to move on from all of this and uh, find another way. Uh, regarding the judiciary, that has certainly been tampered with over the years. Uh, there are, uh, there have been many instances of um, manipulations of the judiciary and uh, judges standing up to the power structure and finding themselves out of a job. So essentially, if you want to stay uh, as a judge, uh, you kind of do what you're supposed to do. No judge in his right mind would ever have accepted, or her right mind, would ever accepted the evidence against Anwar uh, as viable. But, you know, he was convicted for sodomy twice. Uh, now, there's a question in uh, the um, chat. Overseas Malaysians, how do they? Um, okay. Well, and I think what I uh, what I said in the talk about overseas Malaysians is that they do tend to be somewhat liberalized in the sense that we understand that term by their time overseas and really no matter where they are overseas. Uh, and so there I, they are perhaps more prone to thinking in terms of, oh, Malaysia, you know, uh, it's making us ashamed. I uh, can't believe the goings on there. Uh, and which is why, you know, the postal, the overseas postal vote, they have the right to do it, but, you know, kind of like vote, vote suppression here, the idea is, eh, you know, you may or may not get your ballot on time. We may not be able to record it on time. Uh, so um, we, um, you know, did see in that video, and by the way, you know, seek it out on, on, uh, on YouTube. It's, it's quite fun, even though everything's gone to hell since. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, so the overseas postal voters um, uh, were certainly, uh, I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's not that many votes, but were certainly a force that uh, if they could be suppressed, uh, I'm sure Najib wanted them to be suppressed. Uh, and um, something else I was going to say to that, oh, one of the things that has come up 
lately. And Bridget Welch, who was a longtime commenter on the Malaysian scene, Malaysian political scene, seems to think that at some point the young folks are gonna take over. And by the way, you know, Mahathir's 95, Anwar's in his 70s, Lim Kit Siang is gonna be in his 80s. I, I didn't look that up, sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got this incredible cadre of old, older men uh, at the top of everything. And Bridget Welsh sees the young people who are allegedly less concerned with issues of race, less concerned with issues of sexuality, less, you know, um, far less taken up by any of these mainstays of Malaysian politics in the past. And at some point they will have an effect and they'll take over. I just keep wondering when it's gonna happen. Uh, and, you know, the same goes in this country. We think, oh, well, young people don't care about these things the way older people do. And yet, you know, we still have this incredibly bad race situation in this country. And, you know, we're not seeing the change or the turnover or the empowering of the youth to the extent that we, we might like. Uh, why do you think there's a difference in how citizens perceive the power of their actions in the political sphere, especially among Malaysians? I think if you're in Malaysia, you do get kind of bludgeoned by the constant. Right now, Malaysia suffers from the same thing that the United States suffers from in terms of there's too much information, conflicting information, information that uh, comes from questionable sources, but nonetheless gets passed around, thrown out, thrown about on WhatsApp, et cetera. And so, as we know, what this does is just engender distrust of information in general. You know, nobody knows what's true. So, um, you know, in the country that may be uh, a bit stronger and it's also very deep rooted, outside the country, uh, Malaysians may find some potential for uh, adopting at least some idealism. But whether they can get back in the country and make a difference or make, um, you know, make uh, waves uh, remains to be seen. I don't know when the changeover of generations happens. And again, something y'all might comment on, not only in terms of your own political situations, but even in terms of the United States. I don't know when this, this alleged sea change is actually going to happen. We had a question from Larry Ashman. Is there any active role for women in Malaysian politics? Women have been involved in Malaysian politics for a long time. Uh, and maybe the testimony to the fact that, that they are uh, embedded in Malaysian politics is that they're embedded in all the same um, points of view. You know, if you're part of, if you were part of the Barisan when it was ruling and you were a female politician, you mouthed the, uh, the Barisan line. If you're part of the opposition, uh, you mouth the opposition line. So yeah, they're actually fairly prominent women in Malaysian politics and there have been. Uh, unfortunately, they're not necessarily forces for change. The only ways in which they, they buck the system to some extent is when, for instance, you have Sisters in Islam, uh, which is not specifically a, a political organization, but they'll fight against things like, um, um, polygamy, uh, polygyny, because uh, Malay men, Muslim men, are allowed to take uh, four wives uh, if they they want. Uh, and um, sisters in Islam have have you know fought against that. So uh, yeah, I, I would say that um, in keeping with something of a Southeast Asian pattern, uh, you will find uh, Malaysian women uh, becoming involved in politics. Uh, and involved to the point where they simply kind of support the system as it is and don't um, don't rock it. Are there any more questions? That may actually have exhausted it. By the way, one MDB scandal. This is just a rumor, but you know I'm a, you know I'm into Malaysian politics, so of course. There may be a motion picture coming out about it um, with the executive producer perhaps being Dr. Michelle Yeo. Uh, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> it will make a great story. Well, have you answered Kayleen's question in the chat? Which, which question? 
The question about um, the difference in how citizens perceive the power of their actions in the political sphere, sphere uh, sort of. Well, I thought we were talking about the difference between the overseas voters, for instance, and the voters in Malaysia. Is is that? Uh, it's the next one. It's a it's two okay. after that. Malaysians seem to be quite passive and submissive to power by just right. accepting. Right, and I thought that's what I was talking about. Um, let me see if I've, I've misinterpreted that question. You you touched on it, yes. Uh, difference in how they. Or Kayleen. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Right, Kayleen, have I answered your question? Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Although I think, uh, I hope I did. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, uh, just to let you know, you can get in touch with uh, Professor Boulanger, if I said Boulanger, that correctly, yeah. here at uh, UW-Madison. She's here in, in uh, is it, uh, Demographic studies, what was it again? Well, no, I'm working in the UW Survey Center. Um, sure. But, you know, just, you can just um, contact me, um, you know, through the program or, you know, cboulanger uh, at wisc.edu. Uh, so, or you I'm can in get in touch with the center and we can contact, uh, connect you. So, uh, if there are no more questions, I'd like to give a virtual round of applause to say thank you very much for a terrific talk. And, uh, and then this will conclude our Friday Forum Lecture Series for today. So thank you.